we're going to be looking at the doctor and the preacher appeal for reform. Um, the reason I call every message the doctor and the preacher because, to be honest with you, I don't ever know what I'm going to preach about. Uh, and I get up early and I prepare se several different sermons. I have no concept. So he told me to call it the doctor and the preacher. And that is simply the blend of the gospel with the health. Appeal to reform. And God want to reform his church so they can work. The church of God is in a war. It's a warfare. And the church is God's immune system. In other words, it is there to be on God, to be watchmen. It is to be a guide to the blind. It is to be education for those that are ignorant. It is to sound an alarm for those that are silent. In Isaiah, the 56th chapter, verse 10, it says, his watchmen are all blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb, dumb dogs. They cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving the slumber. Yea, they are greedy dogs, which can never have enough. They are shepherds that cannot understand. They are all looking to their own ways, everyone for his own gain from his quarters. Then God said in the 12th verse, come ye, said they, I fetch wine and we will fill ourselves with strong drinks and tomorrow shall be as this day and much more abundance. So God is letting us know that he want his watchman in every religious persuasion to be on God for the flock. But in many cases, many of these religious persuasions have forsaken the flock and they're seeking out the filthy lucre, praise and adoration of man. But I believe there are some that would hear the word of the Lord, even this day, Jeremiah the eighth chapter, second chapter, verse eight. The priest said not, where is the Lord? They're not concerned about God coming back, not concerned about it. They're having heaven on earth. And they that handle the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me. And the prophet prophesied to Baal and walked after the things that do not profit. And that's the condition this world has found itself in. In this dark and gloomy day when the church has forsaken Christ, Christ make a cry, and the cry is, Behold, the bridegroom comes. And as he prepared people to receive him in his glory, he had to once again awaken their conscience, fear God and give glory to him for the hour his judgment has come. In other words, God is trying to sum a message to the world to wake up out of their stupor and see that God is about to judge himself. And why would God judge himself? Because there's nothing in us to judge. So God searched himself. And how do God find himself? By looking at his people. What is God looking for? God is looking to see how much of himself is found in his people. And then through that, God will judge himself. Very close and sacred is the relationship between Christ and his church. Christ have a very intimate relationship with his church. He, the bridegroom, and the church, the bride, he, the head, and the church, the body, connected with Christ, then involved connection with this church. So whenever work is to be engaged in this era of reformation, that work must be connected with his church. Uh, else it's going to be sending arms and means here and there all over the place, and expending funds and and not showing any profit at all. And so God wants his church to be rightly organized, working together for the common goal of reflecting Christ. The work of the true medical missionaries is largely a spiritual work. So even though we're talking about medical missionary work, it is largely a spiritual work. Don't ever forget that. Don't think the herbs and the treatments and the detox and the cleansing it's all to it. That's a small percentage of it. The only reason why God gave herbs and treatments and died is to instill faith. 
to give us an object lesson, something physical to see that may engage that might engage us to exercise faith. It includes prayer and the laying on of hands. He therefore should be as sacredly set apart for his word as a minister of the gospel. So a medical missionary physician should be set aside, ordained as a minister of the gospel. There's no difference. You see, Jesus Christ was both a doctor and a preacher. You cannot separate the medical work from Christ. If anything, he was more doctor than he was a preacher. But the medical work cannot exist without him. They are closely bound together in a marriage. Those who are selected to act the part of missionary physicians are to be set apart as such. In other words, these people that are called to be medical missionary physicians, they are set aside just like an evangelist, just like a preacher. And no other enterprise should engage the activity. They should be focused on the purpose by which God purposed them to care for. This will strengthen them against the temptation to withdraw from the sanitarium work to engage in private practice. In other words, God didn't want no inducement that would carry the medical missionary physicians away from their post of duty. He wanted them to be as safely set apart as a minister of the gospel. Then he said, no selfish motives should be allowed to draw the workers from his post of duty. Council on Health, page 540. There's a call today. And it's the same call that Christ made many years ago. Calling these disciples together, Christ gave them their commission. And as ye go preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. Behold, I sent you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents, as harmless as doves. Matthew 10, 7 through 16. That call was made to the, to the 12. That call was made to the 70. That call was made to the 3,000. And that call now is made to the children of the 3,000. And we are the final generation to receive that call. But we have a most awesome responsibility as a church. And that responsibility is Enoch, Abraham, David, and even many of the great prophets and amends of God of old, renowned men of the word, these men, even Moses, will not be made perfect without the perfection of this final generation. If we fail to reach the perfection of Jesus Christ, and I want you to understand what that is, that perfection is be ye therefore perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. God has set a high standard, a high calling. He didn't say be almost perfect, or be a little perfect. He said, be ye therefore perfect than perfection. And that is the perfection of God. And believe it not, brothers and sisters, that is not blasphemy. That is an invitation, an invitation with a helping hand that he will enable you to reach that perfection by the life of his dear son. You see, we can do nothing of ourselves, but we can do it all through Christ. That simply means that if Christ and the Father is expecting us to reach that type of perfection, we need to know how to do it. And this reform process, we simply must understand we cannot keep the law, we cannot love, we cannot obey. But if we can keep Christ, we will keep the law. We will keep love. And we will fulfill the commission that he's commissioned all of us to do. God wants an in and wish to be enacted. He wants an open door of evangelism. Nothing will open doors. Now, I emphasize that nothing. That means crusades, that means tent meetings, that means camp meetings, that means all them good things. And believe it or not, those are good things. I don't, mind, I don't mean to put them down. Those are glorious things. But God has emphasized that nothing will open doors for truth, like evangelistic medical missionary work. In other words, camp meetings and all our big meetings, they are wonderful. 
But if you want to reach this world, that is a laser house of disease and sickness, you must use the medical missionary work. This will find access to the hearts and minds and would be means of converting many to the truth. So God wants us to get to the point that we stop recycling each other. And that's what we have become, a religious denomination of recycling people. Every time we have a crusade, because of the efforts being repeatedly performed, we find ourselves rebaptizing each other. And in order to have a number of worthy of the great message and the high calling, we simply rebaptize each other. That's not what God is calling for. God wants this open door for the world. And the world is ready for it. But we're going to have to change our method of reaching. We're going to have to use the same method that Jesus used. Remember when Christ came to this world. This world was a laser house of disease and sickness. Sickness was everywhere. And there was great philosophers and great teachers in the days of Christ's ministry. But he chose not to come as a great philosopher, a great preacher. He came as a great benefactor of mankind by, the, by combining the medical missionary work with the gospel ministry. Medical missionaries, evangelists who is prepared to minister to the diseased body is given the grandest opportunity of ministering to the sin-sick soul. Such an evangelist should be empowered to minister baptism to those who are converted and desire baptism. Medical missionary work is the right helping hand of the gospel to open the doors for the proclamation of the message. And so now we are ready to go to work, but we have one obstacle to remove, and it's the obstacle called a door. You are not to set up in business for yourself. This is not the Lord's plan. You are not to unite with unbelievers in the medical world. Neither is this the Lord's plan. You told me you want a reformation. I'm giving it to you. You might not want it when I finish, but I'm going to give it anyway. You see, I work for God, and I fear no man. Uh, I'm going to do what he tells me to do. And many of you may not never hear this again. And I don't need no more. I don't need nothing on my record. I got enough. I got to try to get out by the grace of God. Neither is this the Lord's plan. In other words, we are not unite with unbelievers in the medical work. God had a work for his people to do, and that was a sanitarium work, where we could bring people in, out into the country and reform and transform them away from the hustle and bustle of city life. His word to you is, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness and what communion has light with darkness? And what concord has Christ with the uh, What part has he that believes with the infidel? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. And God has said, I will dwell in you. Again and again, I have been instructed that the medical missionary work is to bear the same relationship to the work of the third angel's message that the arm and hand bear to the body. Under the direction of the divine head, they are to work unitedly, preparing the way for the coming of Christ. The right arm of the body of truth is to be constantly active. There should be no competition between the gospel ministry and the medical work. They both have their part and they're both needed. You see, and I speak directly now to you medical missionaries, medical missionary work will never convert a heart. It will never do it. But it can bring that heart to conversion, and that is through the gospel ministry. That's why we need each other. The, the gospel ministry needs the hip and hand of the medical work that he may bring souls that they may hear the gospel and he prepares them to receive the gospel. They ought to be constantly at work and God will strengthen it, but it is not to be made to body. Sometimes we get so caught up in all the glamour and the glitter of medical missionary work and all the accolades of what you've been able to do and then all of a sudden 
you get to the point, I don't need the body of Christ anymore. I can do this thing by myself. Please don't come to that point. Do you're going to have a great fall. At the same time, the body is not to say to the arms, I have no need of thee. Don't ever let the body, which is the church, reach a point where it says we have no need of the medical word. The body has need of the arms in order to do active, aggressive work. That's why the church is sleeping. That's why the church is not growing. That's why the church is inactive. It's because it will not use the arms. And arm is the medical missionary work. Both have their appointed work. Each will suffer great loss if work independently of the other. 16, page 288. So if the medical work thinks they can prosper without the gospel, and the gospel thinks they can prosper without the medical work, you would do great harm if you pursue this course of action. Those who disparage the ministry and try to conduct medical missionary work independently are trying to separate the arms from the body. In other words, they reach a point and say, I'm going to do my own thing in the medical work. I don't need the body. And you, God is warning us, what would be the results should they succeed? You should see hands and arms flying about, dispensing means without the direction of the head. The work would be become disproportionate and unbalanced. We see that so much. We see that throughout all the self-supporting, independent, and corporate work. We are in balance because we disproportionate it because we're trying to do it without the direction of the head. That which God designed should be the hand and the arm would take the place of the whole body. And the ministry would be belittled and altogether ignored. And God don't want that out of us. Medical missionary work should be a part of the work of every church in our land. I thank God for Balaam SDA Church that is using this time to emphasize the need of medical missionary work. There need to be a weekly reminder also, not just health and emphasis week. Disease don't take a vacation. It's there every day with us. And every Sabbath, the sick is coming. They need to be reminded is some type of health emphasis every week. And when they cannot come, teams of medical missionaries should go into the home and minister to them. Medical missionaries, you are not just to wait once or twice a year for you to present your different treatments or different ideas on health. You ought to be actively looking for members and the world how you can help alleviate their discomfort. Disconnected from the church, it will soon become a strange melody of disorganized atoms. It would consume, but not produce. Instead of acting as God's helping hands to forward his truth, it would zap the life force from the church and weaken the message. And they're watching us. We put in all this garbage in the newspaper and magazines and videos about the weakness of the church. We never get around to talk about the strength of the church and it's weakening the message. People are losing confidence in us because we are so have so much infighting that we don't have time and strength enough to fight the enemy. And the enemy is sitting back with his hand folded, letting us destroy each other. Conducted independently, it will not only consume talents and mean needed in other lines, but in the very work of helping the helpless, apart from the ministry of the word, it would place men where they would scuffle on Bible truth. Now, let me come in a little about the worst evil. I know that many are writing that the worst evil is the rapid progress of the paper power. Many is writing that bringing flesh meat into the church, swine, is the worst evil in the church. Many is talking about the deplorable condition of our dress reform is the worst evil in the church. Let me tell you something, that is not the worst evil. 
Hear the word of the Lord as I share the word for you. My brethren, and don't let me fail to mention the Sunday law. The Sunday law is not the worst evil. Let me tell you what the worst evil is. My brethren, the Lord called for unity and for oneness. We are to be one in faith. I want to tell you that when the gospel ministry and the medical mission of work are not united, there is placed on our churches the worst evil that can be placed there. I hope. I hope we understand that. So out of all that rapid development of paper power, the Sunday law, legislation, eating all type of abomination, it is abomination and it is an evil, but they are products of a people that have turned their back on the health work. If we were so involved in the health work, we wouldn't have time for all of those things that are disselling our faith and weakening our message. We'll be focused in helping souls. We will build on our strength instead of feasting off our weakness. Our medical missionaries ought to be interested in the work of our conference. You know what I'm talking about. I ain't fooling with them folks. I don't want nothing to do with them people. Now you telling God what you want. And he's supposed to be the head. He's supposed to tell you what he wants. You said our medical missionaries ought to be interested in the work of our conference. And our conference workers ought to be as much interested in the medical missionary work. That is not Maimon Wilson. I, you know, the please don't say Brother Maimon turn Trent Coat. I'm telling you the word of God. God said that. And God wants oneness and unity in his church. And it's gonna take humility to do this. This thing is so embedded in us to be at warfare among each other that in my human, intellect, I cannot fathom how it can be fixed. But evidently, Christ know the end. A twofold service. You greatly need divine wisdom to enable you to serve in two positions of responsibility, as a skillful physician and also as a preacher of the gospel. There must be a daily conversion in order to blend successfully the work of the body and soul. And so, we have to be, every pastor that is called to preach the everlasting gospel must be a medical missionary. And every medical missionary that would minister simple treatments must be a pastor. And God sometimes must send us out by twos in order to accomplish this. It is the medical missionary that are needed all through the field. Canvases should improve every opportunity, grant them to learn how to treat disease, Physicians should remember that they will often be required to perform duties of a minister. Medical missionaries come under the heading of evangelists. Workers should go forth two by two that they may pray and consult together. Never should they be sent out alone. The Lord Jesus Christ sent forth his disciples two and two into all the cities of Israel. And so God gave this commission. So when the pastor go, or the Bible worker go, they should take a medical missionary with them. This shows balance, and it will help the unity of the body. The gospel ministry is needed to give permanence and stability to the medical missionary work, and the ministry needs the medical missionary work to demonstrate the practical working of the gospel. Neither part of the work is complete without the other. So you got the spirit and the law. The law would be the medical missionary. The spirit would be the gospel. But I can tell you that it's going to be a tough battle. Satan will invent every possible scheme to separate those whom God will seek to make one. But we must not be misled by his devices. If the medical missionary work is carried on as a part of the gospel, Whirlings will see the good that has been done. They will be convicted of it, genuineness, and will give it their support. That is so plain. Lord, open our eyes that we may see the wonderful things you reveal in your word. You know, all through the word, God has made it plain how that we as a people can do this work. 
And there was times when the work had went through some really tough crises with Dr. Kellogg. Dr. Kellogg had a lot of zeal and he was one of the most knowledgeable men in the world when it came to the health world. But he lost confidence in the ministry and brothers. He, he lost faith in them. They was not health reforms. No, they wasn't. But Kellogg bared down on them severely. He lost full confidence. Ellen White reproved him of his attitude. Being a medical missionary, he should have been a physician that could have diagnosed his patient and recognized that they had a terminal disease and they had need of a healing balm, even Jesus Christ. If he had ministered that herb, then he would not have taken a position he took. That position caused him his demise. Christ has given us an example. He taught from the scripture, the gospel of truth. He also healed the afflicted ones who came to him for relief. He was the greatest physician the world had ever knew. And yet he combined with his healing work the imparting of soul saving truth. Again and again, I have been instructed that the medical mission work is to bear the same relationship to the work as the third angel's message. And it should be under the head of our divine captain. You know, sometimes when you meet people, medical missionaries, and you want to pray with them, that God would heal them. This is what God said. Many have expected that God would keep them from sickness merely because they have asked him to do so. God did not give God their prayers because their faith was not made perfect by words. Now, I want to give you an example of this. Yeah, and one of them is altar call. An altar call, you know, we do it every Sabbath, and people all get up because they all got needs. We all got needs, and they come till you tapping up to the front of the church. And the young people are watching them. You see, they are not spiritually inclined. They there because they have to be there, most of them. And if they see you coming every Sabbath, here comes Sister Joan. She's going to tell us about her pain in her knee. And, and Brother Robbins, he's going to talk about his back pain. They already got it worked out and rehearsing it over and over again and sniggling and laughing at you. You come up there, have the same problem, next have the same problem. Then you wobble right on back. This is what I'm talking about. Many have expected God would keep them from sickness merely because they have asked him to do so. That pastor can ask God to remove them aching pains in your knees every Sabbath for five or six years. If you don't do something, it ain't going to happen. But God did not regard their prayers because their faith was not made perfect by works. God will not work a miracle to keep those from sickness who have no care for themselves, but are continuously violating the laws of health and making no effort to prevent disease. You are set feasting on the very thing that have made you sick, but you come asking God to relieve you of the sickness. The first demon need to be relieved is that demon of disobedience and following the word of God. And then you will remove the obstacle by which God can work a miracle. Now let's open this door so we can go into this message. The right hand is used to open doors. The right hand is the medical word. The door is a barrier and we are closed in through which the body may find entrance. So the body is shut out from the world because the door is locked. This is the part the medical missionary work is to act. So the medical word must act the part to help open the door so that the body can leave the house and go out into the world and labor for the fields are white already. It is largely to prepare the way for the reception of truth for this time. The medical missionary work is to prepare the body to comprehend, receive, and digest truth. You can talk about all the wonderful truths of righteousness by faith, but if the body is corrupt, it will not assimilate it because it's not digested properly, it's fermented. 
bringing about all type of confusions in the body. A body without hands is what? Useless. That means a church, which is the body, without hands, which is the medical work, is useless. Once again, I didn't say that. I'm not capable of saying that. I would have said something a little better. I would have said a body without hands can do something. I'll be just like that biblical prophet. Lord, Lord, I've done this in your name, and I've done that in your name. And God said, I don't know. A body without hands is useless. And given honor to the body, honor must also be given to the helping hands. So it's time to give some honor to the medical missionary work, which is the helping hand, which are agents of such importance that without them, without the helping hands, the body or church can do nothing. Therefore, the body is treated indifferently. The right hand, refusing its aid, is able to accomplish nothing. Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive, and the recovering of sight to the blind. He is set to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable years unto the Lord. That is my call. I pray it is the call of every child of God. God want to reform his people and transform them that all things may be made new. given up on us. There's still breath, there's still hope. Medical missionary evangelists will be able to do excellent pioneer work. The work of the ministers should be blended with that of the medical missionary evangelists. The Christian physician should regard his work as exalted as that of a minister. Ministers, you will often be called upon to act a part of the physician. You should have a training that will enable you to administer the simple remedies for the relief of the suffering. Ministers and Bible workers should prepare themselves for this line of work. For in doing it, they are following examples of Christ. So my word to ministers and Bible workers and cop orders is you need to organize a training, a medical missionary training for your church. And you need to pray and get deeply involved in it so that you can finish up the finishing work. They should be as well prepared by education and practice to combat disease of the body as they are to heal the sin sick soul by pointing to the great physician. They are fulfilling the commission which Christ gave to the 12 and after to the 70. Unto whatsoever city ye enter, heal the sick that are therein. And say unto them, the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. Christ stand by their side, as ready to heal the sick as when he was on the earth in person. So Christ has not forsaken us. Christ has given us the early rain and the former rain power. The problem with God's people, they're reaching for the latter rain. There will be no latter rain power until we exercise the early rain and the former rain. Once we exercise those two reigns, then it was swelled into the loud cry of the former reign. Oftentimes, Jesus ministered in a simple way. 
John the ninth chapter, it is said, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man that was blind from his birth. His disciple was in the school of Christ and asked him, saying, Master, who did this sin? They wanted to know who fault was it, this man or his parents, that he was born blind. And Jesus answered, neither has this man sinned, nor his parents. Lord, but why was he born blind? That the works of God should be made manifest in him. God, are you saying you allowed this man to be blind all these years for a sole purpose that you may be manifested? Yes. I must work the work of him that sent me while this day, the night comes when no man can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he had thus spoken, he spit on the ground, made clear the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Now all eyes was on Christ. They was waiting to see some great miracle. It had been advertised that a great healer would come and people had come out in the groves and they all was stationing themselves over the hills and in the valleys waiting for this great philosopher, this great teacher of health. He walked out, all eyes are on him. He kneeled it down, spit in the dirt, played in the spit in the dirt like a little child. He educated, people of influence were so offended at this childish act that they felt they wasted time to come out and see a grown man playing in the spit like a child. But my dear brothers and sisters, I want you to keep your eyes on Christ. You see, Christ can take the simple things of this world and baffle the wisdom of this world. You see, he made man out of clay. The 16 inorganic and the 16 organic elements of dirt formulated and fashioned man. He breathed in man the breath of life and he received his sight and he came forth, same as it was this man. And he's willing to do that with you today. He's willing to walk with you among the streets of London and throughout. I should be there by your side. Master, who did sin? This man or his parents said he was born blind. Neither had this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent to me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. The devil is walking with him. And he's speaking to his mind. He said, man, you're the biggest fool I've ever seen in my life. How in the world do you expect somebody to restore your sight with spit and dirt? Go home and wash your face. But the man heard not a voice. He was following the word of God. He said, I've come this far by faith. I'm going to finish this race. He still cannot see.
very clear that uh, is this not he that sat and begged? Is he? No, he is like him. I am he. How were thine eyes opened? And then this poor Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed, and I received sight. Did you feel understanding what was once here? Can you feel the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? Can you feel virtue? The Spirit is moving upon you to have this experience also. And if that's not enough, let me tell you a little about Paul or Saul in Acts the ninth chapter. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight or will and rose and was baptized. There are many ways that we can work with somebody with vision problems. And some of these are so simple that the wise would not even consider it. Medically known as a it is a lump that appears under the skin of the eyelid because of a blocked oil gland. It can develop on the lower or upper eyelid. It is not contagious and is more common in adults than children. An eyelid cyst is similar to a sty, but it is usually larger and less painful. It is characterized by localized heart lump and swelling that spreads to the area around the eye and may occasionally cause pain and irritation. When infected, it can become more swollen, red and painful. The most common C. Also violet cysts is blockage and inflammation of the oil producing the bumian glands in the eyelids. People with a history of collasian and those who often touch their eyelids with unclean hands are more prone to this problem. Here is the remedy T. Ocure eye infection, collasian cyst, in only 24 hours. First, boil water and put enough salt in the water to avoid burning. Let the water to cool to room temperature, and then drop the liquid into the eye. Keep water in the eye for one minute, then repeat the process several times during the day. Within 24 hours, your eye will not be irritated and the cyst will be cured. This medicine is excellent. And Well, maybe you don't believe that. Let me, let me just share with you what the Word of God said. The Lord's servant said if you have any inflammation in the eye, she said take a cotton cloth and put some salt in in a cotton bag, warm it up, and apply it as a fermentation to the eye, and it would bring relief almost immediately. So with all these evidence, what hinder God's people? What is it? Is it too simple? I believe so. That has always been a problem with God's people. Simplicity. persecutest thou me? Who art thou, Lord? I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? 
Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. You know, Paul had the same experience that Moses. Moses was a man that had some really wonderful principles. He loved the Lord, the best of his knowledge. One day he went on a journey and he went up in a mount, even a mount of God. He came so close to God that he asked God, can I see your glory? Knowing that God loved him dearly, God told him that if he saw my glory, it would destroy. But I put you in a cliff of a rock, and a rock will heal you. He said, Moses, that rock is Christ. He's the rock of all ages. I put you in him. And when you are put in Christ, that rock that is harder than me, then it will heal you from the direct presence of the Father. What he was telling Moses is, I will send my son and I'll veil him in humanity so that his divinity would not destroy you. And, but when you go to the people, make sure, Moses, you put a veil on your face because you're going to have a bright, hello, light shining over your face. And the people will not be able to see you for all that greatness. He said, but when you come to me, remove the veil. God would love for his people today to come with him without the veil that we can go to God and be face to face. Now, there's some process we must do in order to reach that point. We got to work to do. And a lot of it is we need to enable people to see. Do you know that Benonite clay poultice has been used successfully by many people with eye problems? Benonite clay can pull out toxins that cause many different eye problems and issues. You can take about one ounce of Benonite clay, add enough water to make a nice, cream out of it, and you can drop one or two drops in the eyes, or you can bathe the eyes out with that. It has tremendous healing properties. Is the scientific validated? No, it's biblical validated because God healed the man with spitting clay. God made man out of clay, and God is all the validation that a child of God needs. And if you do not have clay, you can take a simple lemon, Cut it in half, squeeze it. We have a drop, one drop of lemon juice in our eyes. She want to put one drop of lemon juice in our eyes in the morning, one drop of honey at night. Now, you're going to do more than this to dissolve those cataracts. Basically, what this is going to do, this is going to stimulate the tear ducts, make her cry, because there are certain enzymes in her tear duct that dissolve cataract. At the same time, this will lower the pressure of glaucoma. It would do that. Uh, but you, with uh, any type of eye problem, you want to drink some beta carotene or carrot juice. Take beta carotene, carrot, carrot juice, some vitamin C. Make sure you get those bowels going. You want to increase the circulation. You really want to do that. You want to tell us, stop looking at TV with the lights turned off. And be careful with the computers because they can cause a lot of eye damage with glaucoma and cataracts. Okay. You know, whenever I do this treatment, you know, the first thing people say, is it going to hurt? <laughs> I always tell them, you learn obedience from the things which you suffer. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, life can't come unless death is transcribed first. That's the only way life can happen. So really, yeah, it sting a little bit, but it really has a very soothing effect later. But you know, they're more concerned about it burning than, hey, will I get rid of my cataract? I get rid of my glaucoma. Remember, it caused great pain to Jesus Christ to watch you destroy your eyes. And so consequently, it's going to take pain for you also. You got to cross the bear also. <laughs> Oh, Heavenly Father, open their eyes that they may see. Oh, um.
Hey, what's happening? What's going on? He says of Nazareth. He's passing by. What? <laughs> Jesus! Oh, Jesus! <laughs> Son of David, have mercy on me! What do you want me to do for you? I want to see you again. Then see. Your faith has made you well. I can see. <laughs> I can see! I can see! You know, God cannot excuse that cry. He cannot do it. And if all things fail, do what Hezekiah did. When he waited in anticipation from Isaiah to give him good news, Isaiah gave him a death sentence. Told him to set his house in order for he shall die and not live. That crushed his heart. All hope was gone. The medical system had given up on him. The only hope was good news from Isaiah. Isaiah did not have good news from him. So he went in his house, he closed his door, he got up in his bed, and he began to rehearse all the good things he did for God. He had to pour. I brought those that destitute in my house. God, I've done a lot of good things for you. I do not deserve what's happening to me. With all his good points that he laid out before God, it availed nothing. But when the man broke down and started crying, he touched the heart of God. Well, he have a high priest that can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. And that's what God sees now. God is touched. He wants the church to be involved. Arms give to the poor blind man. May he, may the Lord give you happiness. God give you good health. Give to the blind. I was born blind for my parents' sin. When you give, take this and pray for us. May the Lord give you happiness, help. I was born blind. Please, help for the poor blind man. Please. If he could see, no one would give him anything. Leave me alone. Don't touch me. Don't touch me, I say. Master, that man was born blind. He's accepted his life the way it is. Why then change it? He lives in darkness. And as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. No, oh, don't leave my eyes alone. I don't want you to touch them. No, don't touch my eyes. No, oh, ah, you are hurting me. They're burning. What have you done to them? What have you put on them? Uh, go and wash his eyes. Oh, he's about to not only heal this man, but he's about to heal his church. You see, the church have made sport out of the gospel. They're not taking it serious. The simple remedies are looked down upon as some type of folk remedy uh, that, you know, one word, you know, the biblical remedies we see in the scriptures, that was for their time, but today we're mostly looking at chemo, radiation, hormonal therapy, exploratory surgery, and 
all other type of research and different drugs and so on. Even with this pandemic, we are looking for these great men of the earth to come up with a solution. Let me tell you something. They have never been able to come up with a solution how to cure a common cold. And yet you're looking to cure this pan pandemic? Now let's see how God can use simplicity to help this man and help a church that is bent on looking to the world for solutions. God has. The monster has killed the blind man! Can he see? I don't know yet! Give him a good walk! He hasn't touched water all his life! Throw him in! Give him a good walk! Sometimes God must do some things to get our attention. Sometimes we all caught up with the fanfare of things. God gonna stop us in our track. It may be cancer, it may be AIDS, it may be death in a family, whatever it is, but God will allow things to happen to slow us down, to recognize that we need a savior. <laughs> of God trying to get us to open our eyes. I think God will use this to enable his people, Lord, to do the finishing work. I think it's one of the greatest things that could happen. It's sadness that so many people are dying and so many sick. But if we can come out of this thing a better, better fitted for the kingdom of God, then let it be as it was when God brought us out of Egypt, the pestilence, came in order to spoil the Egyptians that we could leave Egypt as a conquered people. Take a look at this young man right here. He was blind. And he wanted to, he wanted to commit suicide. He said, I have no reason to live being blind. And so, he came to our facility as a last hope. I remember that winter day. And I looked out of the window and the snow was coming down. And my son, I took the out, busted the fire, and then set it down. It was cold and it was clean. And I saw this young man seven years ago, he was here. And I thought, take him by the hand, lead him outside. So I laid him out, and with a young man, seven five, one of the chainsaw. I creeped up the chainsaw and put it in his hand. And he cut down a couple of trees and said, I like this one. Then I picked up the axe. I put it in his hand and I got him back in the back on the block of the road and he busted. And he laughed and he said, This is fun. Then after the day, they rolled up a wheelbarrow for me. And he was bringing it to the house.
Sometimes you may not be able to restore the sight or give strength to the land, but you can give them a new purpose in life. You can show them that in spite of these earthly afflictions, God has a better reward for us, a better life for us. Encourage them with a better life. And that there will be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more blindness. He never really received his physical sight. But he went on to be a very successful businessman and started his own catering business. And so God can do that. With glaucoma, he can take a little vegetable glycerin, a little salt and water, take about six ounces of spring water, one teaspoon of table salt, one ounce of vegetable glycerin, mix that together and make an eye drop out of it. Drop about two drops in your eyes twice a day. This will lower the pressure of glaucoma along with detoxing and cleansing. This is the most effective remedy to use. And there are many others, eye conditions that can be used in like manner. This is the story here about Jairus and his daughter that fell dead. Maybe she had a female problem, bleeding and hemorrhaging, her blood count dropped real low. We know Christ had a lot of experience working. Beseech thee, my little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her. She may be healed. She shall live. Take me to your home. Why make you this ado and weep? She is not dead, but sleepeth. Leave this house. simple things we can do. If this young girl had a bleeding problem, maybe uh, she was hemorrhaging real heavy because the estrogen level was too high. It happens a lot with young women. You can make a stop bleeding tea, three tablespoons of shepherd purse, um, four tablespoons of cayenne pepper. Mix those together in 10 ounces of water. Have her to drink a half an ounce of that two times daily. This would help her to overcome the bleeding and to stop the hemorrhaging. Also, if she's bleeding and hemorrhaging profusely, she can also take a cotton cloth 
and place it in a tea made out of alum root. Take about four tablespoons of alum root, boil that in about a half a liter of water, and place the cotton cloth in the alum root tea. Wring it out, but not do well, not wring it out. I about the size it. of a vaginal suppository, pack the vaginal <laughs> pack tightly. Don't worry about it. Pack it tight. Keep her legs elevated on a couple of pillows. Give a 400 mcg of vitamin K. Let her drink that stop bleed tea, and then be ready to give God praise. Ellen White also said that for those that have a low blood count. They could take the egg of a healthy fowl, a chicken. Take that and drop it in unfermented grape juice. Let them drink that. This will supply the system of a necessary yeah. nutrient of men, And it will help build the hemoglobin and their blood count back to proper balance. If you have a fever, sponge them down with room temperature vinegar. Get them a cool animal. Let them drink eight ounces, eight glasses of water a day. During the time of the fever, just put them on a juice diet. Give them a temper to a hot bath. Also, you can get them a wet sheet bath. All of these things will equalize the pressure in the body and bring the temperature down. Opportunity to work with leprosy. It came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. Take so, elder. If you just drink a little hot water before eating, about a half a quart of more or less, will never do any harm, but will, but will rather elder, produce son. good. It would excite your gastric juices and make you have better digestion. If you have a nervous condition, you can drink a little catnip tea. It'll quiet the nerves. If you have problems sleeping, try a little hops tea. It would induce sleep. Uh, if you got stomach in your pain, Apply the hops poultice over the stomach. It will relieve pain. Now, you probably say, well, I tried that, it didn't work. I said, but you know, have you thought about when you do it, do it in recognizing that it's God's remedy. When you say it don't work, you're saying God don't work. God's remedy is work every time. If the eye is weak, if there's pain in the eye of inflammation and soft flannel called wet and hot water and salt will bring relief quickly. The Lord has given us these remedies and if we would use them, charcoal and flaxseed also reduce pain and swelling. Pulterized charcoal is fantastic for digestional problems. 
These simple remedies and many more can be used uh, on a consistent basis. In this time of this pandemic, when there's respiratory problems, do you know that the Lord has given us a wonderful remedy? In a thimble of honey, put a few drops of eucalyptus, stir it up well. Take whenever the cold come on. I have, I have had considerable trouble with my throat, but whenever I use this, I overcome the difficulties very quickly. Have you thought about making your own little cough remedy when you get a cold or you get some type of congestion? These things, making a cough syrup, think about how that you can also take papaya, semi-green papaya, grind it up, warm it up a little bit. If your knees have lost the collagen in your knee and you need a knee replacement, it apply the papaya poultice, semi-green poultice over your knee that have lost the collagen. Do that for about two weeks and don't overwork your knee and it will help restore the collagen in your knee. If you have swelling uh, and inflammation, you can take, uh, have a laceration, you can take a grapefruit, pull the meat out of it, uh, marinate it in Epsom salt and apply it warm over the swollen and inflammation to reduce the inflammation. It will close up the wound so you won't need stitches. If you have peak eye, put a few drops of Lipton tea in your eye. If you have gangrene sore, a cancerous sore, a bed sore, try to use a little sugar and iodine. Take one pound of sugar, one ounce of iodine, mix it together, pack it in the wound. If a person have a heart attack or having a heart attack, give them a little cayenne pepper. It will stop a heart attack within seconds. A cabbage juice is good for uh, gastric ulcers. White potato is good for peptic ulcers. If you have hemorrhoids, you can make a green uh, raw french fry, insert it in the rectum. It pulls the inflammation out. Aloe vera is good for burns. Baking soda is good for burns. Take baking soda powder, mix it in ice water, make a paste out of it and apply it over the burn. If you don't have baking soda, take honey and put it over the burn. It will serve as a mucous membrane until the wound is healed. And there are many more. And I will conclude with this. The Lord provides an antidote for disease in simple plants. He can use water, sunshine, and herbs, which he has caused to grow in the healing maladies brought on by indiscretion and accident. So God has a solution to disease. God has a solution for this pandemic. You know, the Lord's servant said that, that there's healing properties in the pine and the fir and the cedar tree. And you know what? Everybody running around here panicking about this pandemic and God has caused those trees to be right out in our front yard. I had a young man in the UK, they called me one night. He was having major respiratory failure. And they said, we've got to do something. We don't want him to go on a ventilator. Can you tell us to do something? I said, do you have a pine tree in the yard? They said, yes, we have a pine tree. I said, go out there and it's 12 o'clock at night. I said, go out there and pick those pine needles, about a pound of them, wash them real good, boil it for about 15 minutes, put a little peppermint, a eucalyptus in it, a little lemon juice in it, a little vitamin C in it, and a little honey and let him drink it. The next morning they called and said that the crisis is gone. He's breathing easy, no problem. i tell you another one. I had a young man, a young family, a man and his wife and two children. He came down with this horrible condition. I can't say the name, yeah, take the video off the air. But you know what I'm talking about, you smart people. Anyway, he came down with this pandemic. And I told her, I said, it don't look good. Look like he's gonna have to go to the ICU. It just don't look right. Well, late on that night, I told his wife, I said, please try not to let them put him on a ventilator because he may not ever come off of it. Well, he went. When he got there, he told him he do not want to be put on a ventilator. The next day I told uh, Tanya Jackson, I told her to mail him an over, I mean, over uh, next day mail. 
the tonic and some uh, some herbs. She mailed it the next day. It got there. God had already had it arranged. When it got there, she rushed it to the hospital. A nurse was going to bring some change of clothes in for her husband because they was quarantined. You can't go in. So they would take the clothes. She put some of it in the clothes. The nurse took it to him. He drank it. The next day, he walked out the hospital. So I know God is good. And there are many more testimonies. We can witness miracles today if we believe God and his process. The only reason why we don't see miracles today is because we don't believe. May God bless you and keep you. And thank you once again for allowing me to share this simple message with a simple people. And God is looking for simple people that he may use simple means by which he may get all the glory. God don't need the fancy apparatus of this world, but he needs simple faith. May God bless you and keep you. Thank you. Amen.